Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sands. Up next in America's favorite pharmacist segment brought to you by Triquetra Health, we're chatting with the amazing Phil Cowley. Today, we're chatting all about ADHD. That's Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder, meaning it relates to the development of the neurological systems and brain. And the disorder is identified by patterns of excessive and ongoing hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattentiveness. You've all heard of it. ADHD symptoms typically begin in childhood when it's diagnosed and can continue into adulthood in about 50% of the cases. However, if a person is not diagnosed as a child because the disorder is overlooked or left unrecognized, they can still be diagnosed as an adult, and then it gets really hard to unwind. Sometimes a diagnosis in childhood could be missed when the individual's symptoms are less severe in their younger years or when they work to compensate for these symptoms so others don't notice. But here to break it all down for us is our pharmaceutical expert and our weekly contributor, Phil Cowley. Welcome back, superstar. Hey, thank you. This is a great one, but we have to move fast because people with ADHD, we lose their attention. So we'll have to really dive into it. All right, let's go. Here we go. Let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about trends in ADHD and diagnosis. So over the last two decades, we've observed a significant rise in ADHD diagnoses, Phil, with national surveys indicating an increase from 6% to over 10% between 1998 and 2018. What factors do you believe have contributed to this major surge in diagnoses? Well, there's a few things that we have to look at. First is the observance of it. So it used to be if you weren't twitching in your seat and your teacher wasn't grabbing onto you and putting you back, that you didn't have it because you didn't have the hyperactive component. But then we saw such a large rate of failure amongst certain genetic groups, especially families. And we noticed that when we started treating the attention side, they started to succeed more which then led to even a higher rate of how and what we are looking at for ADHD. And then as adults, it's funny, the number of people that come in as adults to me as far, and they're telling me all their symptoms. I'm like, have you ever been even looked at? And they said, no, my dad just said I just needed to work harder. And they never even looked at the attention component of it. So diagnostics have changed. Um, a lot more adults are going in now. And then you also always have to remember ADHD shows up when you're under stress. So some people do really well in middle school, grammar school, school, and even high school. But once you hit college levels, it's harder. So then you stress it, and then the genetic disorder underneath starts to show. It's interesting because the statistics, uh, they don't lie. More than 366 million adults worldwide have ADHD, and that's as of 2020. And around six in 10 U.S. children with ADHD also have at least one other mental or emotional or behavioral condition such as anxiety and depression. So this has to be nipped in the bud early on because an estimated 77% of U.S. children diagnosed with ADHD receive treatment while we have a huge population, close to 25%, that they don't receive any treatment, Phil. So this is, it's scary as a mom to see that this could go uh, not only undiagnosed, but untreated, which brings me into the next topic, medication shortages. So the U.S. has experienced ADHD medication shortages in recent years. Could you elaborate on the underlying causes of these shortages and what measures have been taken to address them? So there's a couple of things I find super interesting. The first one is we have things that are called quotas by the FDA. The FDA says you can bring in uh, so many kilograms of each substance in the United States to be able to even manufacture inside the United States. And each year, uh, it's August, August 23rd is the day they release it. You expect this increase in medications like methylphenidate or, you know, your mixed amphetamine salts. But the last four years in a row, even though there's been shortages inside the United States, those quotas have not been raised. So we don't even have the potential of bringing in the substance to make more of both these medications. The FDA has stopped that, which means our dependence on foreign sources will continue to be there because we can't even allow our manufacturers to do it. But if you look at different manufacturers such as Teva or Teva, depending on which way you want to say it, you know, they're a Jerusalem based company. So every time there's any sort of conflict over in Jerusalem and then we have C reduction in numbers of all of our ADHD medications because we are dependent upon them. So not only is it the number of people using it, but we can't even produce it here in the United States if we wanted to. So we are continually 
reliant upon foreign sources and you know they're great partners until they have crises of their own i had no idea i just learned something new and i i was completely under the impression that most of the adhd medication was manufactured here in america this is interesting that now not only is there a war that's broken out but we have a whole bunch of uh, children here and, and even adults that can't get the medications they need. Now, research shows, and this is interesting because I was researching from the millennial mom's perspective, but ADHD is more common in males than females. So I was trying to figure out what the rate the ratio difference was. But it's interesting because females who do struggle with ADHD typically exhibit more inattentiveness symptoms rather than hyperactivity and impulsive symptoms like you were alluding to earlier on. And there is far less research on ADHD in females. And females may even go underdiagnosed, partly because their hyperactive impulsive behaviors show up differently than they do in boys, which requires further study. But, you know, I do think to your point, there's the practitioners need to be able to truly identify this at an early stage. Now, let's talk about impact of long-term medication use. So ADHD medication use has lasting positive effects on the brain, according to findings from brain imaging studies. Research also shows that leaving ADHD symptoms untreated carries far greater risks, including unemployment and substance abuse, um, than does lifelong medication use. Now, a recent study highlighted a potential link between long-term ADHD medication use and increased cardiovascular disease risk. So this is a conflicting finding. What aspects of these medications might contribute to such health risks? So most of the medications we're speaking about, there are a couple that aren't. They're stimulant medications. And the thing about a stimulant medication is our brains right now who have ADHD, they're, they're lacking a few key components like your norepinephrine and your, and your dopamine. And by using stimulants, we're able to increase or help maintain both the norepinephrine and the dopamine. However, when you take a pill, it doesn't just go straight to the brain and stay there. It also goes to the cardiovascular system. So it makes our heart rate go up. It makes the vascularity itself constrict and causes more stress on it. So you have both sides going on all of the time and it should be expected. It's like opiates. You can take opiates, you get used to it in one way, but the constipation never goes away. It's the one that won't go away. Well, with stimulants, your heart rate will always be increased and the stress on your cardiovascular system is higher. This leads to the thing I always tell everybody though, omega fatty acids are the best way so Triquertra makes this fantastic new uh, omega fatty acid, so it doesn't taste like fish. And when you're taking an omega fatty acid, it helps reduce heart risk almost to the same rate as this study indicates that it may be there. And omega fatty acids are the first thing I tell everybody to take if you have ADHD, if you're trying to naturally help supplement it a little bit. So there are ways around it. And like I said, the, the Triquertra's new brand of omega fatty acids, the one I first leaned to just because it doesn't taste like fish and you get all of the EPA and DHA. Fascinating. I love it that you have a cure for pretty much everything. That's why you are America's <laughs> favorite pharmacist, Phil. Now, if, for those wondering why I'm dressed so fancy with all this, Phil, it's because it's Christmas Eve tomorrow night, my friends. And although we're talking about ADHD, I do want to remind you that time to be with your friends and family is of the utmost importance, especially if you are one that has ADHD and can't sit still. This is a time to really focus because holidays truly do matter. Now, let's go back a little bit here. Experts haven't pinpointed the exact cause of ADHD, although we know that genetics are suspected to play a huge part. And three out of four children with ADHD have a relative with the disorder too. And this is according to APA. Now, environmental factors are also suspected to have a hand in causing ADHD. And the factors can include brain injury, exposure to lead as a baby or child, uh, premature birth, extreme stress during pregnancy, smoking and alcohol use while pregnancy, and so, so much more. But Phil, where where do you think that the causation is coming from if you had to take one educated guess? I think that there was a time where, where ADHD was actually beneficial in nature. I think that those people with ADHD, they kind of have these superpowers in some way. Once they decide to hook onto something, holy cow, nobody can stop them. They're fantastic at what they're doing at that moment, but they're missing out on everything else. And they're also really great in certain jobs, vocations. They actually do really well. I think that the ADHD crisis, as you'd call it, has a lot more to do with how society has now regulated who does what and how. 
And so I think that now that you have to sit in a cubicle, there's a lot of people whose ADHD becomes a weakness because of how they have to work. And I think that's right. where it comes from. I don't think, I think it's been with us from the beginning. And I think that we're all very good at what we should be doing all of the time. It's just not all of us are good about sitting and answering phones all days. It's just not what we were made to do. And that requires now to look at ADHD in a different light. Yeah, because who's to say what ADHD is or isn't? I mean, my daughter is a theater baby. She couldn't sit still even if she tried, but she's a huge, uh, you know, musical theater child and actor and on television and she's eight years old. And, you know, ADHD, if you put her, you know, if you put her in the confines of a classroom and tell her she can't move for eight hours straight, well, maybe she will exhibit certain ADHD symptoms, right? right. So I question a lot as a mother. Now, Concerns about control substances. So let's go back. So given that many ADHD medications such as Adderall and, um, you know, some of the, the methylphenidates are classified as Schedule II controlled substances, what should parents consider when these drugs are prescribed to their children? You know, I, the, the one drug I really love for, for when it comes when somebody gets it saying whether or not it's efficacious or not are the ADD meds. So if I were to take an ADD med because I don't have ADHD and I know this, if I took it, my heart rate would race. I would be all over the place. I would look like a squirrel that's drinking coffee. Like you could not keep up with me. But my son, he's a squirrel with that with drinking coffee. Before I give him his pill and everything goes smooth. In fact, we used to give him high. We had too high of a dose and he would zombie out. So you'll know immediately whether or not this is something you need to worry about by giving it. Like you'll know the first day. And so and it works the same as adults. I just had a little mom come in and she was so resistant to wanting to try it. And I'm like, you have four kids and you're telling me you can't keep track of anything and that life is stressful. And she said, yes. And then she, I said, well, why don't you try it for a week? She came in and she said, I can get everything done. I go to sleep on time. Everything's great. So when you come to controlled substances with the ADHD meds, watch the person. And if it settles them down, they actually don't love it. You'll give it to them and the kids will fight against it. Right. Whereas if somebody takes it and they're you're using it in order to stay up later, to do more, they start using it as a crutch in order to succeed. Those individuals, you won't see that. So I love it because if you talk to the patient, you know exactly what's going on. And then you can reduce your risk because at that point, you'll know who really needs it. Very nicely said, Mr. Pharmaceutical Expert. You've convinced <laughs> me. Now, interestingly, some of the most significant increases in ADHD diagnoses um, has been observed in adults. So now we're seeing that increase. What are some common signs in the workplace that might indicate an adult has ADHD? And I kind of feel like this question is a double-edged sword after the the, 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 the the monologue I just gave. But what's your what's your take on this? So I find productivity is the most important thing. You'll find people who are just frustrated with their own productivity, not because they're being lazy or, or anything else. They start a project and they can't finish it. And soon they have five or six projects in front of them, each done really well, 70% of the way done. And then they come back. And so they're, what they're finding is their inability to complete those tasks become very detrimental to their job and th therefore their lives. And it really frustrates them severely. Also, quite often, a lot of people will say, I think I have anxiety. For some reason, anxiety is that thing that we can have and we don't feel like it's a deficit or something wrong with us. So people who say, I can't get anything done, I feel anxious all of the time, those two are the key words that I look at when I start talking to somebody about ADHD. And then you start digging into more, once you find something, do you hyper-focus on it? When you have a task, you put it off for two weeks and then in 12 hours, do a wonderful job, but you can't even think about it, you set it out of mind. So look at how well you're producing, look at your anxiety level, and then look if you're hyper-focusing once you do finally grab onto something. Those are the three key signs. And millennials are the first generation to really say, you know what, I don't need to put up with this. I need to figure out what's wrong so I can be productive. So that's why I think we're seeing it into the adults. Yes, because there's now so much more proactiveness around ADD and ADHD, even as parents identifying it in children or being able to take the right steps. But when it, it needs to be nipped in the bud and it needs to be taken care of early or on so that, you know, it doesn't become detrimental to not only your productivity, but ADHD 
people with ADHD earn an average of 18% to 20% less annual income than those without ADHD. And childhood ADHD is associated with an increased risk of death before the age of 46 years old. So adult ADHD is associated with a substantial economic burden, contributing an estimated $123 billion in total societal access costs due to unemployment, productivity loss, and health healthcare services. So you are spot on, pharmaceutical expert. <laughs> Productivity in the workplace is the number one indicator or lack of productivity in the workplace and lack of completing those tasks. Key, key, key indicator of ADHD present uh, with, with people in the workplace. With that, we are officially out of time. Thank you so much for coming on, Phil. It's always such a pleasure doing these segments with you. Not only do I learn something, but I know that everybody listening in on almost Christmas Eve is definitely benefiting from this conversation. Well, I talk to you all day long. They just won't, you know, we only have 14 minutes. So let's, we can stop with the radio program. I'll chat with Zen with you all day. I love it. This is so much fun. <laughs> I love it too. Guys, you definitely have to check out Phil Cali, America's favorite pharmacist that was brought to you by triquetrahealth.com. That was the awesome Phil Cali. Check him out on the gram at Phil's My Pharmacist. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this.